So look, my name is Laurie Miles. I work here at SAS. I've done for about 18 years. I'm our head of analytics, um, also known as Chief Geek. Um, I'm also a doctor, but a very different doctor to you guys, I guess. I know a lot about numbers, but absolutely nothing about the human body. Um, so what am I going to talk to you about today? So firstly, I'd like to welcome you to Whittington House, really. Um, I hope we've treated you well. I hope the facilities have been what you needed them to be. You're actually sitting in what used to be the servants' quarters when rich people used to live here. Um, we, we moved here in about 1988, 89, something like that. Previous to us, it was owned by the Salvation Army. Um, it was a convalescent home after the Second World War, for example. We then bought a bunch of land next door, which used to be an RAF base. Um, so if you look at the, the, the plot of land we're actually on here, um, we're actually just on this tiny little bit here. It's actually a whole 130-odd acres of land we have here. And the stuff on the right used to be an RAF base when, when I moved here 18 years ago, full of disused bunkers and all that sort of thing. It actually is where the, um, the bouncing bomb, Barnes Wallace, and where a lot of that work was done and that was developed. So it's quite an interesting site as well. So I hope you've enjoyed your time here. Um, but I'm really here to talk to you about analytics. And people think analytics is a new thing, data's a new thing. Analytics has been around forever. So analytics has been around and helped the Egyptians build the pyramids, for example. You can see a few attempts before they started using analytics well. They kind of iteratively analyzed data and ended up with much better structures over time. And typically in all the projects I work on, it's still that approach. It's an iterative bit of work. You have a few failures and then you have some success. And through history, analytics has been used for all sorts of things, some absolutely appalling things. So even today, my team uses something called Monte Carlo simulation. We use it to solve problems in the investment banking world. Where was that type of analysis developed? Los Alamos to develop the first atomic weapon. So you see that analysis has been used for all sorts of things, and we learned from how it's been used in the past and apply those techniques to different things. And through history, it's been used for some really awe-inspiring things as well. How else could we have put the man on the moon? <coughs> always makes me laugh. He used the film, I think, is it um, Apollo 13, where it all goes disastrously wrong. And you see them trying to get these astronauts down. And there's guys with slide rules doing, doing math, trying to work out how to get these guys home. I would not want to be in the hands of someone with a slide rule, personally. 1976, analysing crop data in North Carolina. It was a university project, and out of that project, a company was born. Three professors using um, an early version of our software to crunch numbers to do their PhD research. They worked out that this would be a good thing for other people to use, and out of that was born a company. So a few things happened in 1976, this being one of them, and this isn't one of our founders, I, I hasten to add. Um, in 1976, SAS was formed. We released the first version of software, we got some revenue, we got some users, we had a user conference. But from small things, great things start. So all of a sudden, we're a company with an enormous campus in the US. You think this is a big campus? It is a thousand acres or more of campus, some 30 buildings of people developing the code we use to solve our business problems. Don't want to bore you too much with our company. First thing I'll say is we're privately owned, and that allows us to do interesting things as a private company. We don't have shareholders to pay, we don't need to make a profit. So we can do things like the work we do with academia. We can do things like supporting um, events like this, for example. We can do interesting things with our money. We're the biggest privately owned software company in the world. We're a big software company, even though no one's really ever heard of us. We dominate the analytics market, and we pump most of our money back into the product. Again, no shareholders to pay, so a quarter of our revenues straight back into R&D. <coughs> Name a country around the world we're in it. Most big companies use SaaS, and we have a bunch of people, some of whom are quite smart. So that's us as a company, really.
So I tell people I do analytics and they think, how dull is that? You're playing with numbers, you're playing with data, really, really boring. Actually, you, it's used for some really interesting things. And you can see some of the problems we solve and some of the companies we work with. Oh, thank you, guys. But what, what's the difference between analytics and just reporting on data? So you've lost lots of people report on data. I'm sure in the room you all use Excel. What's Excel doing when you produce a report? It's telling you what happened in the past. It's very much a rear view, view on the data, what happened in the past. Of course, the problem with that is like yesterday's newspaper, isn't it? Yesterday's newspaper, really not worth very much money. In fact, when I was younger, it's what we used to put our fish and chips in. So yesterday's news, not that valuable. Clearly, today's newspaper has some value, doesn't it? You know the value of today's newspaper. It's actually printed on the front of the paper, which is quite handy. But what if you could actually do more than just look at the past? What if you could actually predict what would be in tomorrow's newspaper? How valuable would tomorrow's Financial Times be? I'd hazard a guess that it's a ridiculous value if you know which, pl which bets to place in the stock market, for example. And that's what you do with analytics. You actually get inside the data. You're not just looking back at what happened. You're looking why things happened, what's going to happen in the future, understand patterns of behavior so you can make better decisions. And that's what analytics is really, really all about. Now, I really, really don't want to talk to you and show you a bunch of equations today. I'm sure it's Friday afternoon. You would all disappear in about two seconds flat. <laughs> It is Saturday, isn't it? <laughs> it's because I'm working. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you. So I thought the best way of telling you more about analysis is actually tell you some stories. I'll tell you from some stories from business. I'll tell you some stories from sport, which is probably what you're also more interested in. So who in the room has got an HSBC credit card or debit card? Several of you, I guess. They own about a third of the market, so I'm sure several of you do. Every time you use that card to make a transaction, be it on the internet, be it in store. What's going on in the background when you're making that transaction? What SAS is doing is making a real-time decision on whether that transaction's fraudulent or not. So while you're stood there waiting for it to say, yes, everything's OK, in those few seconds, really complex models are running in the background to predict, is this a fraudulent transaction or not? And the answer is either yes, it is, no, it isn't, or you get asked to ask some stupid security question, typically involving your mother's maiden name or your dog's name. Um, that's all powered by SAS and by analytics. Neural network models built, running in real time in the background to make that instant decision. And also remember when you used to apply for a loan, you filled in all these forms, you posted them off, you may have to go and see your bank manager, eventually you'll find out whether you got a loan or not. These days, online, fill in your details, about a minute later, you've got the money, let alone make the decision being made. All that powered by real-time analytics, making those credit risk decisions in the background. So it's a good example of how analytics has affected us all every time we interact with our banks. Waitrose, you go into Waitrose, do they have the products you need? Well, they want the products you need in front of you. If they don't have the products you want, you're either going to buy something um, that you don't want, so you're, you're marginally hacked off, you may even buy nothing at all and go to a competitor's supermarket. So it's really important that they get the right products on the shelves. But it's also important they don't have too much stuff kicking around. If they've got too much stuff kicking around, the stock rooms are too big, and perishable goods go off and they have to throw them away or sell them really cheaply. So this is about forecasting what's required in the store. For every single store, for every day, Waitrose running SAS forecasting algorithms to tell me what goes on the truck that day for the following day's deliveries. And it happens on a store basis. So Henley store will get a very different set of stock to the, the Maidenhead store, probably involving more strawberries, I imagine. All that powered by SAS analytics, saving them a bunch of money and also making their customers happier. Probably no one in the room's heard of Catalina Marketing, but anyone that shops at Sainsbury's Every time you get a voucher from Sainsbury's, either printed on the bottom of the till or through the post, how do they determine what vouchers are useful to you as an individual? Well, again, it's SAS analytics determining, looking at your past patterns of behavior, what type of person you are, where you shop, where you live, how you spend your money, will determine what office you get from Sainsbury's. And it's a company called Weave. What Weave do 
is analyze your mobile behavior. It's a consortium from Vodafone, EE, and Telefonica. They take your mobile data and make you marketing offers depending on what sort of person you are, but also where you are, because they know where you are because you've got your phone in your hand. So it's all a little bit big brother, some of this stuff. They know where you are, they know what you're doing, they know what you like. But hopefully what it means is you're going to get stuff sent to you as offers which actually are interesting rather than just why is someone sending me this offer for hair cream. Yeah. It's all about business. We do a lot of work for other organisations as well. London Fire Brigade are a big user of analytics, predicting where fires in London are likely to break out. By doing that, they can focus their safety and um, budget on those areas, talks, upgrades of equipment, etc., to try and save lives. So it sounds a bit hackneyed, a bit cliched, but analytics in this case genuinely being used to save lives. And the favourite projects I work on are the ones we do with our charitable organisations. We do a lot of work with Red Cross. We also do a lot of work with Great Ormond Street Hospital. And this is essentially helping them raise money. Let's not just phone anyone up to say, can you give us a donation? Let's try and find the people that are interested, that are likely to respond to that conversation well. Let's raise some more money, save some more lives. So I think this has been used for all sorts of things, right? From really greedy, rich bankers, all the way through to people that really need our help. But lately what we've been seeing is more and more use of analytics in sport. And our relationship we have with British Rowing is just one of those examples. I'm really, really proud of the relationship we have with British Rowing. I'm really proud to be able to wear the T-shirt. Yeah. Free clothes, what more do you want in life? <laughs> um, so what are we doing with British Rowing? Well, the first thing we have to do is pull all the data together. I've spoken to several of you this afternoon, and all of you seem to have the same trouble. You've got all these bits of data all over the place, and pulling them together to make one bit of analysis rather than half a dozen is sometimes challenging. So the first thing we're doing is pulling all the data together in one place. So this is biomechanical data, weather data, on the water data, et cetera, et cetera. Then giving British Rowing access to technology to, to visualize that data, look for patterns, look for behaviors, give some more feedback to rowers. Over time, we'll move on to building some predictive models and give them some extra analytic capability. And as well as helping the performance team, we're also helping the membership side as well, looking for those members that may be becoming disenfranchised, making sure they, they are attending events, making sure they stay in touch with the people that may leave the organisation. So that's what we're doing in British Rowing in a nutshell. But this is happening all over the place. We have a relationship with New York Mets. This, is re this one's really about the fan base. Again, making sure the fans and membership stay in touch um, with the club and they don't go and support someone else or something like that. And I'm sure many of you have seen the film Moneyball. Have you seen the film Moneyball? Really, really great example of the use of analytics in sport. What baseball clubs used to do is go and spend all their money on star players, in much the same way Premier League teams do now. A few people using the statistics worked out, that's not the right answer. The right answer is to maximise the number of runs you get. Runs? You know what I mean. Yeah. And you do that by having the right team. Let's look for the structure of a team. And actually, a bunch of middle-sized, middle-kind-of-priced players with the right attributes working together with a team will beat a bunch of star players every time. It's a really good film. If you haven't seen it, I'd thoroughly recommend it. And for the ladies in the room, Brad Pitt's in it as well. What more do you want? I really shouldn't be on stage with Brad Pitt. It doesn't work at all, does it? <laughs> Another great example of use of analytics is TriTracker, which is actually an IBM initiative on the rugby side. They get all the data about rugby matches, where, the, where players are positioned, how players are moving, all those sort of things, and they can actually start to predict the number of tries in matches. Unbelievable. It's going to put lab books out of business, that's the problem. So it's not only rugby, we're also doing a lot of work with Toronto Maple Leafs, and this is actually about the performance of the team. What strategy wins out? Now, I can't claim to know anything about ice hockey at all. I know we have a few Americans in the room. I'm sure you know a lot more about ice hockey than me. But how do you set your team up? How's the strategy of the match? They analyse thousands and thousands of matches, looking at lots and lots of different strategies and seeing which ones tend to win out in which situations. So a great example, again, of using analytics for performance reasons. What the All Blacks do is actually use it for injury prediction. Actually getting all the data together, looking at patterns of behaviour, looking at occurrences of injury and seeing if there are any patterns. 
be it from how they're behaving during the game or how they're behaving during training routines. I've actually got a quote which I bothered um, printing out because it's quite interesting. So this is from the senior scientist for New Zealand Rugby um, and he said the, the game is changing. He spoke about how um, looking at footage, how they've actually changed the way the players go about for things to change their performance but also reduce injury. So a really interesting approach. And it's not only happening in New Zealand, it's also happening in this country in football. My team have done three projects last year, all with Premier League or Championship sides looking at what's the occurrences of injury, using data from matches, from things like Opta, Optima, and also from training regimes as well. If you think about it, you spend 20 million quid on a player and he's out of the game for like half the season, that's worth a lot of money. So it's worth some time, it's worth some using some data, it's worth analysing that data to try and predict how to keep those players fitter. So the teams we work to train change their training regimes for certain players to avoid stress in certain situations. Now again, this isn't ever going to replace what the physios and doctors in those organisations do, it's just another tool to help them make their daily decisions. And one place where lots and lots of data is used is Formula One. So literally off of a Formula One car, thousands and thousands of bits of sensor information coming off that car literally every second, off of the engine, off of the aero performance. So they analyse that data to make better decisions about how to design the next car, when to, ch when to ch put in an engine modification, etc. And they also use analytics for their race strategy. I don't know if many of you follow F1, <coughs> but at certain points in the race you have to come in for a pit stop. And it's all about what tyres do you put on, when do you make that pit stop, how much petrol do you put in the car at the beginning to optimise performance versus weight. All those things being analysed by big data analytics by Red Bull, for example. So that's kind of an end of stories. Before I move on to what's going on next in this sort of world, has anyone got any questions on what I've spoken about so far? I've really, really bored you, haven't I? <laughs> Fine, I'll move on. I am conscious I'm keeping you from your loved ones. So what's happening in the future of analytics? So we've been doing this stuff for a while. I myself have been doing this for about 26 years. Um, the analytics being used in business for even longer than that. But it's constantly changing, constantly evolving, which makes my job actually quite interesting. What's happening next? Well, this, this god awful term, big data, which we seem to be constantly bombarded with in my industry, data volumes are increasing all the time. It used to be my bank knew where I'd lived, my balance, and that's pretty much it. They now actively record and keep every transaction I make. My telephone company keeps records about every call I've ever made, about where I am in the country at any one time, about all my internet usage over that time. And increasingly more and more data is going to come from wearable devices. At some point this year, I think the iWatch comes out at some point this year, that's actually a sensor you'll be wearing and carrying with you all the time, capturing lots and lots of information. And of course, everyone these days is constantly on the internet. I know my daughter is constantly playing about on Facebook, playing about on Twitter. All that data is being captured and being used. So data volumes are getting absolutely enormous. And the technology has to evolve to take advantage of that. So we see a new technology. You'll hear about something called Hadoop, which is an open source technology allowing people to store billions and billions and billions of rows of data at very, very low cost. <coughs> So data's getting much, much bigger, and we have to kind of deal with that in my world. But it's not only getting bigger, it's also getting more varied. When I was a kid, there was one type of Kit Kat. It was four bars, and it was brown, yeah? And there was one type of Coca-Cola. It came in a red can, and that was it, yeah? These days, there's lots and lots more variety in things like Kit Kats and Coke, but also in data. It's not just ones and noughts anymore. People are analysing text, people are analysing audio, people are analysing video. Lots and lots of different varieties of data, and that's also something that analytics has to take account of. Completely different techniques to analyse someone's comments as opposed to analyse how old they are and where they live. So we've had volume of data, we've had variety of data. The other V of big data is velocity. 
Data's coming at us much, much quicker, and we need to give answers out much, much quicker. The kind of real-time decisioning when you make a credit card payment is a good example of having to make a decision, bang, then. It's not an overnight run anymore. You need to make a decision in a second. And data's coming at us all the time much, much quicker as well. So I'm playing about on my iPad, on Facebook. I'm following, say, Amazon. They notice what I'm doing. They want to notice what I'm doing as I'm doing it and make me the offer there and then. Because they've got me. They've got a captured audience. They don't want to send me something tomorrow when I've forgotten what I was even doing. So data's coming at us faster. We need to do stuff with it quicker. So that's about the velocity of data and things are happening really, really much more quickly. So this is all a really, really interesting world, but we do have some challenges. One of the biggest challenges we have in this world is a skills gap. There are not enough analysts in the world to deal with all the data that's being produced and solve all the problems that people want to solve with that data. And part of this is because kids have got so many more choices these days, haven't they? I mean, my daughter is a fantastic mathematician and she's doing further maths, maths and physics for A-level. What's she going to do for a degree? She proudly told me last week she's going to do drama. I nearly, I nearly picked myself. Uh, honestly, I didn't, I didn't shout, I didn't scream, but that's a great example of someone that could be a great analyst is choosing to do something more interesting with her life. Uh, <laughs> so there is a skills gap in the market, and so our industry has to face up to that challenge and come up with solutions to it. One thing we do as a company is we really support the academic programmes. We give our software free to all schools and universities, again, to try and make sure there's academic people coming through with good analysis skills. And I've already been collared by some free software by two schools today. Um, but the other way we can solve that is by making analytics more accessible to anybody, so that anyone can benefit from analytics. And one way of doing that is making the tools much more easy to use, much more point and click, so people are working in the environment they're used to. It used to be, to be an analyst, you had to be a programmer, yeah? writing lines and lines of code. All of a sudden, you can just play with some witty graphs and point and click your way through the data. It's much more visual, it's much more interactive, and makes analytics much more accessible to, say, a business person as opposed to a geeky guy like me. So this is a good example of the interface, for example, that we're providing to British Rowing to help them analyse their data. And the other way we can help people benefit from analytics is by doing it for them. Yeah, so rather than actually giving people software, actually solving people's problems for them, which is part of what my team does and also part of the work we're doing with British Rowing. So don't hire your own geeks. I've got a bunch of geeks. They look something like that. That's typically what their desks look like. Um, <laughs> and let us solve the problems for you. So that's kind of really all I had today. Um, I deliberately finished early because it's a Saturday afternoon. Um, thank you for your attention, but if anyone's got any questions, I'll be delighted to answer them. Thank you. Um, the last few days have been getting into the hard data gap. You can measure things. What do you do with... Um, human variability. Um, I come from the NHS. On the 27th, the whole system pretty well tipped over because predictions of human behaviour were totally off the scale. How much data do you need to then get that sort of human prediction? Well, do you, um, do you something abnormal, do you mean? Something you haven't seen before? Okay, so all this analytics stuff does rely on a big assumption, which is the future looks something like the past. Yeah. So what we do in forecasting problems is we look at the highest things that have ever happened, and we look at weight of increase, and you set an upper bounds to a limit to a problem. Yeah. But if there's something bizarre, something unusual, unfortunately you can't predict that. By its very nature, it is unpredictable. I remember I was sitting um, with our owner and founder, um, Jim Goodnight with HSBC a few years ago and it was just after there had been some space shuttle incident and a guy from HSBC asks Dr Goodnight um, couldn't you have predicted that would happen couldn't you, you know, couldn't you have seen that would happen and as he said we'd need those mothers to be falling out of the sky at one a week to be able to predict that <laughs> so you can't predict something which is new <coughs> brand new you can look for proxies you can look at similar events that have happened before which is how we deal with new product forecasting for example unfortunately there's always going to be something that's Odd. I, I know it's not very reassuring, but it's true. Yeah. 
Okay, in which case, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed your two days at SAS, and um, I wish you all a very safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.